Switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me What the fuck, yeah Can't do this alone, God Get my blessing, and I don't know where it is, 
it, so I watch where I'm stepping And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression Cause once upon a time, had to learn a little lesson Read it, in the holy book, I know the reverend said it You're Different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me. What the fuck? Yeah, can't do this alone. God help me. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the fuck? Yeah, God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. Yeah. Bless me, yeah.
Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey They would love me But what does it matter If he ain't rooting for me God help me With the uh, Yeah Can't do this alone God help me God help me Can't do this alone God help me With the uh, Yeah God help me Can't do this alone God help me With the uh, Yeah God bless me Can't do this alone Bless me, yeah.
Not the kids, something funny. Right, perfect. Hey, thank you guys for your patience. God bless you. Let me see who all's in here. If you get here as well, we back to the other microphone. So if we got to turn the volume up, let us know. That way we don't get too far. No, we can't hear. Kevin, I got your. I love you, man. I got. We can hear. Yeah, give me some thumbs up if y'all can hear well. Carl, bless you. All right, all right, all right. Hey, Marissa, I can't wait to see you. My Adrian. Hey, Dan's fine. Cindy, bless you. Dominic Stevens, God bless you. Close on my mic a little more. Jalen, push up the volume on the fader just a, just a, just a hair. You probably bring it to zero. Hey, Brando, twelve days music. Hey, Angela, Carolyn. Okay. My patience, bless you. All right, perfect. So let me see how. We ended up right where we needed to be. <laughs> hey, Nikki. Well, listen, it feels like it's been forever. It hasn't been forever, but it feels like it because we, we're always doing so much and not in a bad way. But we hit him. My mother said she can't hear us anymore. Is that better for everybody? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> said might as well have been six months. I had someone, she's probably watching. I don't know if Veronica's watching yet, but she messaged me and was like, why did you block me offline? And I said, I don't think I blocked anyone because I, I typically don't block anybody. I said, I don't think I blocked anybody. And she says, because I said, well, you're talking to me right now because we were on Instagram. I said, so can you see my page? She's like, yeah, I can see everything. I said, oh, I just haven't been doing anything. I was resting. She said, oh, I thought I was blocked. Because we do, we hit it so much, like, boom, boom, boom. It's all, You know, we're always hitting something. So when we took that last bit of the year just to kind of relax and rest, she thought she got blocked. So nobody's blocked. No block ministry unless you, you know, do something worthy of being blocked. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, I'm going to do my best, Ma. Um, you can turn up just a smidge more. Anything after that, you're going to have to. We got to figure out how to help my mother get some headphones or something. Air Max going crazy. It's small. But I want to start the new year off right. You understand me? Yeah, so happy new year to you all. New year, new me. We tried to start on time, and we still the same us. <laughs> Felicia was new. She tried to get it. She tried to start it on time. Felicia and Mother Janika did, but apparently I'm still myself. But <laughs> it's just like you know what it is. You just know what time it is. You know what I'm saying? So do me a favor while we get started, share this with a few people. That way they can be blessed and they can receive also. Yeah, New Year's same me. A lot of people got New Year's new me, <laughs> New Year's same old me. Yeah. Yeah, share share it with a few people. That way they can be blessed and that way they can receive. Let's get those numbers up just a hair. Not much, but just a little bit. Let's get him up. And it was good. I took the last week or whatever that was, and I was just quiet. And I took time, I told you, to reflect on what was good, what was not good, and find space and grace with God. And I hope you guys were able to do the same. And while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, next... Monday, I put the wrong dates when I put it in Telegram. I realized that after Drew told me. But next, not this Friday, but next Monday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 
we'll be fasting together, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And what we're going to do is a little bit different. And we'll do midday prayers also, so anywhere between 12.30 and 1.30, Felicia will do midday prayer. But then in the early morning, she'll be doing devotion also. So I don't know whether that would be 6 a.m., 5 a.m., not certain, depending on how God moves. But we'll have morning devotion. Amen, saints? All right. So go get your spirit together. <laughs> but by the, based upon the reception, it's probably going to be more like 6 a.m. Amen? All right. Somebody said, oh, man, I ate a brownie obsession from Friday. It's way too early then. Yeah, you got this whole weekend to cut up. And then we we get our spirits right back together. Yeah, you got you got this whole weekend. But we want to make sure uh, we want to make sure that we lead the year just as we exit it and enter the year so into the spirit. We have to keep the same energy. Keep that same energy. And it's easy to lose sight of things if no one holds you to task about it. And not saying that I'm the one to hold you to task, but even Paul said that you need a taskmaster until Christ arrives in your heart, meaning until you're driven to this on your own, someone has to help you in that process. So if someone doesn't put the expectation in front of you that, hey, we should pursue God, we should love him, we should look to him, we should fast, our desire should be him, you can just look up and then you'll do it sporadically, but you don't have a life of intention. And if you don't have a life of intention, you're going to have very little spiritual experience. You're going to have very little spiritual encounters. You're going to have very little interaction with God, truly. You have interaction with him like he loves you, he cares for you, he provides for you. But the interaction that I know people are looking for, that's only found with intention. It's never by happenstance, amen? Yeah. So next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll have a devotion in the morning and then prayer. And then what I'll do is I'll do prayer on Wednesday. We can do prayer and teach them. But I like when Felicia lead the prayer personally. She kind of have that. She bring that power. All right, perfect. So it looked like the numbers, uh, the numbers went up some. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Now, in light of what we're going to be discussing tonight. Let's just kind of see how this goes, and um, we'll try to stay true, true to time just so we don't keep people long, but in light of talking about the thumbnail or the title, or whatever you want to call it, Death Before Time, this is something that, what's the way you could put it, in light of every man has a life expectancy, right, every man has a life expectancy that comes from God. Now, in light of that same life expectancy, you have the perfect will of God, but then you also have what we consider the permissible will of God. Or like what Paul said, that which is perfect, that which is good, that which is acceptable. So there's different levels all inside of God. But he is the one that it tells us that he has ridden our end from the beginning. So we see our life from the beginning, but God sees it from the end. Now, in light of God seeing it from the end, he has purposed and numbered our days, but we also play a part in fulfilling that purpose. We also play a part in seeing to it that if God has purposed for a man to reach this destiny at this time, we play a part in hindering that or in aiding it. And so when we talk about death before time, we're going to look at some men of God. We're going to talk about a few things, and then God will give us grace to understand that every man has an assignment. And that's truly what it's about, not necessarily about a man dying before his time. We'll talk about that, right? But it's just kind of like, excuse me, it's just kind of good catch, catch buzz, you know, clickbait. So if you're looking for us to just talk about people dying too early, you probably, you probably got got. 
<laughs> I told you, New Year, same us. <laughs> <laughs> New Year, same on me. So, but in all honesty, what you have to understand that this life is a journey, and it's a journey that every man must pass through. Because remember, this is not our home. It's easy to become acquainted and associated that this is our home, because this is where we spend our time. This is where we spend our time. Now, a man who spends his time in the spirit can easily be acquainted that this is not his home you see the difference the man that spends his time in the flesh gets acquainted that this is his home the man that spends his time in the spirit understands that this is not his home and that's where when you hear men who carry that desire they are men who have been with God so not that you know you hear me say man I look to the day that I'll go you hear me say things like that but that's based upon experience meaning that God puts Every encounter puts a longing inside of you to never be cut off from that again. Every single one of them. So when people are like, oh, yeah, I just want this. And the thing is, God has put eternity inside of the hearts of every man. God has put it in the hearts of every man. But do you have the capability to unlock it is a question. God has placed eternity inside the hearts of every man. So remember I said that there's layers inside of it. So, of course, eternity inside of the hearts of every man is that. God is eternal, and so when his spirit is inside of us, the heart represents the spirit. God has placed eternity inside the hearts of every man. That's one level of it. But God also places eternity inside the hearts of every man. Do you have the capacity to draw down into yourself and pull that from out of you? And most people will never get into that place without intention. Without intention, it just doesn't happen. There is no way around it. But Paul said it best. He said that I'm living this life and I don't know if this tent, this, or Peter, excuse me, Peter said it. He said that this tent that I have is going to one day fade away, right? And he talked about tent. He wasn't talking about a physical tent. He was talking about the tent meaning this body. Tent meaning is not a permanent establishment. That's what he talked about Abraham. Our forefathers, how they dwelled in tents, right? Meaning they didn't have a permanent residence. So when I say that this tent will soon fade away, what I'm saying is that this is just a temporary housing. This will pass away. But that which is eternal will stand forever. So when you hear that language and we talk about tents or things like that, I'm referencing what Peter spoke about that. This tent here will rot away. Paul even also spoke about it because he said, was it? I, I'm not certain if he was speaking to Timothy. I can't remember it to come to me. But even when Paul was speaking, he referenced and he talked about, I'm not sure if I'm ready to leave now or if I'm going to stay a little bit longer, meaning he could have left at any moment when he was ready. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I'm not sure if I want to stay in the flesh because it could help you and be profitable to you, or if I'm ready to go on home. That's what Paul said. Now, Paul also died at the hands of men. He was persecuted. So that was also part of what God had prepared for him. So even in that, remember, there's destiny there. Destiny is a part of the life assignment. Paul said, I'm here, but I've completed what God gave me to do. That sounded like Jesus. Jesus was praying, and before he had ever went to the cross in John, John 17 or 16, whatever one we read it some weeks ago, right? He said, I finished the work that you've given me to do. I, The Son of Man is no longer here in the earth, but he was present there, but his heart was somewhere else. And that's where we have to grow to the point that our hearts are with God. So you can look at me here, but I could be somewhere else. You see, and that's what I want for every child of God, that they could understand that this tent is fading away. But the home that stands forever is where you want to be. That's why we fast so that we can be humble before him, because if we're humble, we receive his grace. His grace is a person. You understand? It's not just, oh, yeah, let's just do this. Right. Why he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And because we're in need of his grace. We do the things that cause him to draw near to us. And you've heard me say it, but God is more willing to draw near to us than we are to him. He says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. So anyone lacking an encounter is lacking waiting on God. And that's where most people trouble at. You know, John and I talk about waiting on the Lord. Most people can't wait on God because we have a microwave complex. 
that we, you know, especially the black folk microwave complex where we hit that plus 30, plus 30, plus 30, plus 30, plus 30. <laughs> we, I have never stopped and been like five minutes. It's like, dun, 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 dun. we started multiplying early. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> My kids know math because of that plus 30 on the microwave. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You, <laughs> you hit the joint, right? But even, <laughs> even in our life, and service to God is very much that way. Whereas plus 30, plus 30, plus 30, plus 30, and we don't have the ability or we haven't developed the spiritual capacity to just wait on God. So then we do miss out on encountering him. We do miss out on encountering him because even when we pray, and I say we, although I'm not including myself, even when men pray, most of the times it's a monologue, not a dialogue. I would say 90% of men's, not speaking about any person, meaning man is creation. 90% of man is creation's prayer is spent with them pouring out their desires and their hearts to God and never hearing his desires or his heart. Never hearing his desires, never hearing his heart, never even, never even waiting for him to speak. Because if I speak to you, I have to stop to listen to you speak. It's very much the same way with God. That I have to stop and listen so you can speak also. Now he says, while they are yet speaking, I will answer them. While I will hear them, while they are yet still speaking, I will answer them. Do you have the capacity to stop what you're doing if God starts speaking? Most of us don't. So a lot of times, God has already tried to speak, but we're so focused on let me get this out. 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 You ever had a conversation with someone like that where you're having a conversation with them, but by the time it's done, it's always it's all about that person. And I mean, for an example, let's say you may be going through something, need advice or in need or just trying to express something, whatever is serious about you. But by the time you're done, you minister to them. <laughs> right? By the time you're done, you're counseling them. By the time you're done, you're advising them. By the time you're done, you're edifying them. A lot of people pray the same way. A lot of people say to pray the same way where God is looking to speak to you. But in turn, you just cut him off and make it about yourself. But he was already going to come down your street if you just be patient and just wait on God. Amen. And so this life has to be lived in the spirit. And if it's lived in the spirit, man understands that the only way to interact with God is in spirit. So you won't do so much talking. And so this year... You know, obviously I'm not as, oh, this year, this year, this year. But I do want us to practice being quiet. I do want us to practice being quiet. For the time that you spend praying, I want you to practice equally spending the time being quiet. Hey, bro. She like, dang. <laughs> your face gave, you, you gave it up with your face. <laughs> You gave it up with your face. I wasn't even talking to you. <laughs> well, that wasn't me. That was only the Holy Spirit convicts us. <laughs> I'm here to edify and to build up. But that's what I want us to practice this year. I want us to practice the art of just as you pray, I want you to practice the art of also being quiet. And then we'll work on Throughout the year, we'll work on the art. Remember, we're going to do school of meditation, so I'm going to teach you. But we got to first start with just, by the time we get there, we should have a group of people that have practiced just sitting and waiting on God. Amen? We should have a group of people that have practiced the art of just being before him. That's the part most people miss, the willingness to just be before him. Now, in light of when we talk about death before time, there's a lot of things that go into it. There's a lot of things that go into it. But God has determined the lifespan of every man. That comes by God's story, not by ours. Even in the scriptures, we saw that he would give men a certain amount of time, right? What was it, se what was it 70 years? What was it, 70, right? Now, obviously, from the days of Adam, Adam, from the day you eat of this tree, surely you shall die. 
Right. But Adam never died a death physically. But he did die a death. The death was that he was separated from God. So death before time is always about you being separated from God first. Even when a man dies, it's about him being separate from God. Because remember, no man truly dies. But then even there, there's certain, um, you know, I don't want to use big words, but there's certain paradigms about God that, or there's certain dynamics to God that everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's certain dynamics even with, with God. He said, the fit is crazy. I bought this thinking about Sean. I said, ah, hey. <laughs> I literally was like, I'm going to get him today. But he said that he says, Adam, on the day you eat of this tree, surely you shall die. Surely you will die, is what he says. And we all know God, God doesn't mess his, God doesn't mess his words. God doesn't mess his words. Adam, the day you eat of this tree, Surely you shall die. Adam was a dead man walking. Separate from the presence of God. If God cuts you off, you're as good as dead. If God cuts you off, you're as good as dead. We'll go to Revelations in a little bit. Kevin, you are too much. You are a tree. I love you so deeply, Sean. Backs out of fit competition for February. <laughs> Julie John said, I've been out. <laughs> I'll tell y'all now, just kept, uh, Sean is going to barbecue all of us. Just get ready. <laughs> I've already seen it. <laughs> I had a little situation I was putting together, and then I just realized, because I could see too, and I just stopped. And I said, you know what? If you can see the L coming before it comes, don't just don't just fight it. Just take it. <laughs> just it's like that's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson. Like no, so I too yield, and we already have <laughs> we already have a first place recipient, and that's my son Sean O'Dang. <laughs> yes, I took the prophetic L. I saw it. I said, you know what? We're gonna rock with something already on the rack because. <laughs> We're not spending money to get roasted. <laughs> That's what we're not doing in 2024. Oh, we love you, Julie. As long as no patients ain't dying, stay up in here, though. Taking the L in the spirit is wild. That's crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. We just, we, we're moving in and out. That's all. I'm going to say it's like a pressure valve. You got to learn how to navigate it. Now, John, find that for me so we can say we read something. See, I told you, New Year's same us. I told him, I said, one day I'm actually prepared for it and teach. I'd be, <laughs> be amazed at what God can do. Hey, Ashley, I love you. Find that for me, John. Uh, Adam, the day you eat of this fruit, or the day you eat this fruit, tree, so you should die. Y'all give John a second. He's pulling up scripture. While he's pulling that up, y'all ready for February? Everybody, y'all getting everybody getting this stuff situated? Listen, I'm telling you, February is gonna be special. It's going to be special. 
You got it? Okay, tell them what, what we're reading because I don't even know. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 15. Thank you. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, so he says, All of these trees you can partake of. However, this specific tree, what did, what did the black folks say? Pacific, Pacific, <laughs> right? Pacific is the ocean, specific. <laughs> hey, what that girl said on Instagram? She said, uh, the girl that's always like, hello. I know a lot of you call me, uh, I'm not Santa, but I stay slaying. And to that, I say, thank you, that girl. I can't remember. <laughs> but she, she said, uh, that's what she said. She says, I know a lot of you are fighting the earth to say Happy New Year's. Don't say it. Take that S and put it back in front of Pacific like y'all be saying and make it specific. <laughs> <laughs> that girl, she said, I want you to fight the earth this year because you're going to do it say Happy New Year's. It's New Year. Take that S and put it back in front of Pacific that y'all been saying and it'll be specific. <laughs> So he tells him, Adam, on the day you eat of this tree, surely, read it again for me, John. So he commanded who? So he didn't command a woman. All right, go ahead. So the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But then within the genealogy, it goes on to tell us how long Adam lived. So on the day you eat this, you shall surely die. It says that God is not a liar, right? God is not a man that he should lie. We know God to be truth. So was God lying or is death something different? And what I'll tell you is that one, God was not lying. Two, death is the transition between two states of existence. That's the first level of death. It's the transition between two states of existence. It says, Adam, on the day you partake of this tree, surely you shall die. And Adam died. He was cut off from the presence of God. If you're cut off from the presence of God, your state of existence is different. This is what Revelation teaches us because it talks about those names who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life shall taste of the second death. Mm. That second death is that they're cut off from the current state of existence, meaning being able to be connected to God. Mm. Remember I told you that God has placed his spirit inside of us, and that spirit is what gives us the ability to interact with him. When that spirit is removed from us, uh, outside of the sovereignty of God, you don't have the ability to interact with God. Sovereignly, God can do anything. So God's not beholden to what he has said also, right? God's also not beholden to what's written. But he tells us in the scriptures that you should do these things so that you will not partake or you will not taste of the second death. But those men had already died the first death. The first death is a physical state of existence. The second death is a spiritual state of existence. So Adam died the second death immediately. Mm -hmm. The moment he sinned and partook of that fruit, obviously it was a conscious decision. We've talked about what Adam did. Mm -hmm. So we're not teaching about Adam tonight. But the moment he did, he was cut off from that state of existence, which was being in unity with God, mm -hmm. being able to walk with the presence of God. And from that moment, his state of existence changed. Mm -hmm. You notice outside of Jesus coming as the second Adam, we don't hear anything of Adam anywhere else after that. Outside of the second Adam, his name isn't mentioned ever again. It shows you the kind of mess up we have here. We see plenty of men that mess up in their names are continually, their stories are continually heralded, so forth and so on. Adam's fall, we don't hear his name mentioned ever again. 
And when we hear it, we only hear it mentioned in light of the second Adam who will come and make things right. They don't even reference him teaching his children. Adam went on, when we look at Cain and we look at Enoch, Adam was a highly spiritual man. Remember what he learned inside of the garden, he implemented outside of the garden. Adam understood sacrifice. This is how Cain and Abel understood that in the process of time, they were supposed to bring offerings every so often. This is how they knew that. Their father was the one teaching them to interact with God. He doesn't even get any credit for it. They don't even tell us about Adam after he fell. It's not good enough to just do right. You got to do right all the way to the end. What I tell you all the time, yesterday's righteous is not enough for today. Today's righteous is not enough for tomorrow. You need Jesus every day. Every day. What's good for today isn't for su sufficient for tomorrow. What's sufficient for tomorrow won't suffice for the day after. You need fresh manna every day. You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You got to be able to partake of Jesus every day. Because the manna that you had yesterday doesn't work for today. So in the new year, make sure that you're partaking every day. Because what was sufficient for last year won't work this year. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I'm not beholden. That's why you always hear me say, man, don't. I never make it about a pattern or I never make it about a cookie cutter type of thing. Because if you get locked into this cookie cutter thing, you can miss interacting with God. Because what was sufficient for yesterday may not work today. You see what I'm saying? So with Job, he speaks from the whirlwind. It says that he called out to Job. He says, Job. Stand up straight, fasten yourself, and come out here and speak to me like a man. This is God confronting Job. Come speak to me like a man. One, that's terrifying. Two, nothing's cut the same. Because when the whirlwind comes, when Elijah's inside of the cave, God wasn't in it. So if we base it upon God being inside of the whirlwind with Job. Every time a whirlwind comes, we'll assume God is speaking. You see that? Or on the vice versa, we look at Elijah's life, so we say it's always the still small voice because he wasn't in the whirlwind and he wasn't in the shaking and he wasn't in the fire and he wasn't in these things. But then he speaks to Job totally different. But then he deals with Moses and he deals with him from the fire. So you got three different men with three different encounters and none of them are the same. But if you try to take Moses' encounter and make it yours, you could be locked into one thing, and then there's all these other ways that God wants to interact with us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So even in that, yesterday's experience is not enough for today. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's encounter is not sufficient for next week. Right? And not, su not meaning it's not sufficient like it won't do. Like, mm -hmm. the encounters I still have, they're all near heart. They still move me forward now today. But what I'm saying is that Nothing can be held to, like, oh, this is this. Right? Yeah, that's the best way. Thank you. you I don't set up camp and make a doctrine of it, around it. That's the best way to say that. I don't set up camp and make a doctrine around it. Now, <coughs> Adam, like I said, he fell. And in his fall, we never hear him mentioned again. Because he transitioned states of existence. Adam was a dead man walking. Now, remember, God has... Determine the life balance of every man. So from Adam, you saw the lifespan like this. Then from Abel, you saw the lifespan obviously extremely shortened because Abel was a sacrifice. I've taught you about that before. But if you don't know, I'll teach that at another time. But Abel was a sacrifice like a type of Christ. He was the first to be shed of the prophets. The first blood of prophets ever to be shed was Abel. That's why it says that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. But it's not that Abel's blood doesn't speak good things. Mm -hmm. It's just the blood of Jesus speaks better things. The better things are that it can atone for sin. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The better things that it can suffice on the mercy seat. But it's not that <coughs> his blood is not speaking. Mm -hmm. Because remember, within all blood is the life force. So blood has the ability to speak also. Blood has the ability to speak also. That's a whole different story in light of how frequency is wired through your blood and there's actual sound to it. But you see the lifespan of men continually drawing shorter. So then you look at Cain, lifespan drawn shorter. You look at Enosh, 
lifespan drawn shorter. You look at Enoch, lifespan drawn shorter. You look at Methuselah, lifespan drawn shorter. You look at Noah, lifespan drawn shorter. Then you look at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, lifespan drawn shorter. Moses, lifespan. So then by the time you look at it, when men went to living all of these years, now men are living like what, 70, 80 years, was what, what God promised. I don't remember the exact scripture, but he talks about man would have, according to these days, it was something like 70 to 80 years. Don't hold me to it, but it's somewhere in that range. Now, in light of that, that 70 to 80 years, right? You can look today and we see people dying before that time. You said 80? Read it for me. Read it out loud real quick. Perfect. So that's why you heard me kept saying it's like 70 to 80. Mm-hmm. Right. It's in my heart, but I don't always have it. Just like Genesis 1 and 3 says this. <laughs> I just don't live like that. <laughs> right. So she said it. <clears throat> that is 70, and then if by reason of strength, 80 is what man has promised. But then we see some that extend that, mm-hmm. and then we see some that don't even make it to that. So somewhere inside of there are some factors that we sometimes are unaware of. Somewhere inside of that are some factors that we're unaware of. Now, in light of that, all of this also is the providence of God. (coughs) All of it is the providence of God. But the biggest thing you have to understand is that the first step that we're talking about is the state of existence where man is to walk in unity with God. Man is to walk in harmony with God. Man is to walk in communion and fellowship with God. If a man doesn't have that, he's already dead. If a man doesn't have that, he's already dead. That's why God would go on to talk about and he would liken it to a man's heart being like stone. But then he would give him a heart that's alive, a heart like flesh. You see that? God likened his presence joining into a man's life as his heart being made alive. So God likened a man separate from him to already being dead. That their hearts have been hard or their hearts are like stone or these stony hearts, but I will give them a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh means a heart that's alive, a heart that functions, a heart that can exist in unity with God. That makes sense? Now, in light of that, when we talk about transitioning or, or transitioning but the existence between the two different states, when we talk about physical death, because we have to do a physical death just as much as we deal with the spiritual side of it, right? <laughs> he said, I heard someone say, if you make it past 80, you clocking overtime. You are clocking overtime. That's nothing but the grace of God, because it's not owed to us. It's not owed to us. Now, we understand that the spiritual side is that man is cut off from his unity, his fellowship, his communion with God, but the physical side we have to deal with also. Now, a lot of times, I'm not saying to diminish the physical side, but sometimes we put too much emphasis on physical death. Too much emphasis on it. Even in that, God created the physical body. Obviously, there's sicknesses, there's diseases, there's afflictions, there's infirmities. There's all these different dynamics that are existing within the world that men can be made subject to in their physical bodies. But even in that process, when that is happening to a man, he's being transitioned from one state of existence to the next. He's being transitioned from one state of existence to the next. So even when we look at the prophet Elisha, Elisha died of sickness. But this was the same man that could raise a young child from the dead. This was the same man that could cause a barren woman to have children. Yet physical infirmity reigned in his mortal body physical infirmity inside of the same man who could give healing to others infirmity reigned inside of him but if we don't understand the process by which 
we deal and exist sometimes in this physical world, we could think maybe something was wrong with Elisha. Or perhaps he was being judged. Or, or different dynamics that we try to come to conclusions of when all it was simply that Elisha was being processed from one state of existence into the next. And that was the way in which God chose to do it. That was the way God chose to process him from one state of existence into the next. And so it's kind of like there's some people I remember when I was helping a friend and they were doing some different things, helping someone, and I told them they were trying to see if this person was up. And I said, well, the Lord says he's ready to bring them home. And this is what he's going to do. So tell the family to prepare themselves. If they did not have that word, they would have continued in thinking that this was something that was not from God. Not that he said, oh, I'm going to grant sickness to come upon them. and play. No, He was simply transitioning them from one state of existence to the next. That's it. He was simply transitioning them from one state of existence to the next. But if we don't understand that transition process, we put too much weight on one side and not enough on the other, and then vice versa. But what we have to understand is that every man is traveling to his eternal home. That home far away on the celestial shores, if you heard me talk about. Every man is journeying there. And the only thing we want to do is journey there having completed our assignment. That's the focus that we want to have. So when we talk about death before time, the death before time is that you show up not fulfilling what you were given to do. Now, every man has a different measure of assignments. Every man has a different rank in his assignments. And then we all have a baseline. That baseline, excuse me, is the foundation that you're going to go there for, preach the gospel, make disciples, teach them to obey all I've commanded, and lo, I will be with you to the ends of the earth. That's for every man. Now, we did when we started doing an assignment, assignment may be a little bit different because he told us to do it, but he never told us how to do it. He told us to do it, but he didn't tell us how to do it. So if you try to do what I'm doing, it may not work because that's how God told me to do it, right? But then if I try to do what you're doing, it won't work because it's not how God told me to do it. That's where assignment comes into play. We're working kind of like if we're working for the same company, but we all have a different job role. In a sense, it's, a, it's an assignment. That's all it is. We're working for the same profit and loss statement of that company. All of us are working for the same profit and loss statement of a said company, but each one has a different assignment to push that forward. <laughs> that makes sense? But then at the foundation, we all have a general level of like, everybody has to go through this, right? No matter which part of position you work in the company, Everybody got to go through HR and fill out their payroll stuff, <laughs> right? Everybody got to do the basic stuff, and then from there, each man is assigned his task. Amen? So when we talk about death before time, what you need to realize and consider and reflect on is that every man, you want to arrive before God having fulfilled everything he told you to do. So you can be like Paul. What you have given me, the race that you have given me to run, I have already completed it. In order to complete a race, you got to know where you're running. You see? It's not just by happenstance. You got to actually know the trail. You got to know the path. And you got to know where you're going. The race that you've given me to run, I've already finished it. Now, we see in the scriptures a lot of different occasions where God even wants to institute a man's life being cut short. And then we see intervention also. So a lot of times there's intervention even inside of the lifespan of people. So when we look at King Hezekiah, it was that he was to die at a certain time. You want to find it for me. You don't have to read it. Just find it for me just so I can uh, have a reference on it. <coughs> mm-hmm. He said, I can only imagine the satisfaction and fulfillment Paul felt saying that. May that be our portion. Amen. Yes. That would be our portion that we could say, the work that God gave me to do, I successfully completed it. You know, I told you I take an assessment. I took an assessment this last year. like, And when we took the assessment, I was there to talk with Julian Fleish. I said, what God gave me to do, I completed it. And now we're in a new year. And what God gave me to do this year, we're going to complete it. And God will continue to add to us until he calls me home. But even then, I'm aware that 
him calling me home, there's certain things I have to do first. So even in that, I'm fully aware that there's a certain grace to keep me alive because there's a certain assignment to do. You see what I'm saying? So even though Paul said, I've finished my race and I've run my course, Paul couldn't die until he had completed his assignment. So there's spiritual workings that are happening, even like when the snake comes and bites Paul. And then they said, what manner of man is this? It didn't matter what the snake bit him. God had already tasked that there were certain things that he had to do, like get to those Gentiles. You see that? All of that destiny hung up inside of a man. God God was fully vested that he would live until he was finished with his work. It's kind of like when I taught you about Jonah. Jonah, go to Nineveh. Go there. And Jonah said, I'm going to go down to Tarshish. And then he goes the exact opposite way. And then inside of that, he gets consumed. Then he's inside of the beast. And it says that I cried out from Sheol. The waters were surrounding me. The weeds were around me. The bars were in front of me. And I cried out from Sheol unto your holy mountain. And you heard me. And then Jonah gets brought back to life. He gets placed back in his assignment. And then he goes to do what he was told to do. But Jonah's life was restored because he still had a work to complete. You see that? His life fulfillment was based upon his assignment. God kept him based upon what he had to do. God literally kept him based upon what he had to do. So even inside of that, when a man has an assignment from God, there's nothing that can stop him. When a man has an assignment from God, there's nothing that can stop him. Now, a lot of times we don't realize the power in reasoning with God. So we could look at a man like Hezekiah. That's what I was asking you about. But I'll paraphrase it. Hezekiah, <coughs> the prophet comes and tells him, I want you to prepare your home. I want you to make your home ready because at this point, God's bringing you home. Is he doesn't say it like that. That's just my words of how he's saying it. God's bringing you home. Then in that process, it says that he turned and he turned the face to us. And then the prophet has to come back and says, God has added, was it 15 years, John? Was it 15 years? God has added 15 years to your life. Now, most people would think that that was the grace of God in adding or in keeping his life, but it was truly the mercy of God that was trying to take him out because God had already knew about his son. And the reason he wanted to take his life is so he would not have his son. He knew his son would turn him away from God. So sometimes God is working things and we don't see. So he didn't truly have death before time. He had death after time. He didn't die when he should have died. He should have died when the prophet came in and said, today, prepare your house. Instead, we get the hellacious son that he produced that went on to turn people away from Jehovah God. You see that? So that's why I say nothing's cooking cut it. Everything we need the heart of God on. Everything. We need the heart of God on every single thing. Because here's a man and God is saying, I'm bringing you home. But if we stand to intercede for him, we don't understand that God's trying to fix a nation. And that man plays a part in it and his seed and his generations. You see that? But then if we just, based on what, we, what we've always known, we can miss what God is trying to do. That's what you always hear me say. Sometimes people call me and say, hey, man, give me a second. Let me, let me get before God. I'll tell people that. Hey, hold on. Let me let me get before God first. I'll tell people. Some people will call. We got slow down. Slow down. Don't make any hasty decisions. Because God could be doing something right now. And if we apply, remember, it's like the whirlwind. If we think it's the whirlwind and it's something different, we've now missed God and we're off trajectory. You see? We've missed God and now we're off trajectory. So you have, when we talk about death before time, you have the instance where God is killing a man. But it all it's all in his pleasure and his purposes. God is killing a man, but it's all inside of his pleasure and his purposes. And we have to understand, do we understand the purposes of God concerning everything in front of us? 
Because if we don't, we'll keep something alive that God wants to kill. And God wanted it dead for a purpose. Or we'll kill something that God wants to be kept alive. We'll kill something that God wants to be kept alive. So it's kind of like the word of God tells us, suffer not a wish to live. So I'm all, you know, I'm I'm to get busy with a witch dude, like, and not in public. I'm talking like, all right, let's go there then. But I'm also the guy that's not willing to be cookie cutter because perhaps God will use him as the next apostle. Mm-hmm. So it's like the young man that's, and he's not young, but it's like the guy who's going really viral now <coughs> in light of sharing his testimony about he was married to, I, I didn't listen to it personally, but y'all told me about it. Y- y'all talked about it, right? <coughs> God kept him for such a time as this. That man's been laboring in the harvest field just like we've been for years. And at the right appointed time, God brought him to the forefront. When it was needed most, God brought him to the forefront. But what if he was subjected to your spiritual warfare to suffer not a wish to live? You see? So and and I'm the guy that's I'm the guy that's you suffer wish not to live. But I'm also the guy that's we need the heart of God for every single thing. You understand? We need the heart of God for everything. <laughs> we need the heart of God for everything. Every single thing. Because if not, we don't have that we don't have that gentleman. God will raise up another. So I mean, I'm also understanding that God can raise up another very easy. But I mean, I'm just not willing to not seek God to have his heart concerning things is what I'm saying. I'm not saying we allow what you to live. I'm not saying any of that. Don't, you know, don't put the words in my mouth, but hear my heart. My heart is that if I'm with God, I can have his heart. And his heart will help me with every single thing. Make sense? His heart will help me with every single thing. And that's why... I am willing to have his heart concerning those things. People call me all the time when people are about to die. And the reason they call is because they know I can help them. But it does no good if I can help them and it's not God's will. You see what I'm saying? Because now you can be in a position where you're fighting God. Or there are a lot of times where someone is suffering something and it's at the hands of God, not at the hands of man. God is destined that this is the tool that he will use to shape them. This is the tool that he will use to perfect them. This is the tool that he will use to humble them. But then there's grace inside of you that can help people who are going through those things. But if you don't realize it's the hand of God and not the enemy, and you help that person, now you're an enemy of God. Because you delivered them from the hand of God. You see? You didn't deliver them from the hand of the enemy. You delivered them from the hand of God. And so because of it, just like Moses. Moses, just as much as he laid the plagues on Egypt, he could have lifted them off of him also. If he was moved by Pharaoh's tears, he could have lifted the plague off of them. But if he does, he becomes an enemy of God. Because God was making war with the gods of Egypt. You see? So you got to have the heart of God concerning everything. You got to have the heart of God. You said, sheesh, what happens with you? You got to have the heart of God concerning everything. Hmm? Emma. Yeah, you got to have the heart of God concerning every single thing. So now you have, we talk about death before time, you have death that's orchestrated by the hand of God for his plans, his pleasures, and his purposes. You also have the death that man is separated from God, right? And now you have the death we're going to talk about that's by your own doing, by being foolish. There's a death that the scriptures teach us about that dying the death of a foolish man the scriptures talk about there's a death about dying the death of a foolish man John I'm gonna uh, Anita I want you to find something for me in a second John find me (coughs) there's a scripture that says and Abner, or should Abner die a death, a foolish death, or something to that extent. So don't don't hold me to how I said it, but you're looking for those phrases. Abner, and he talked about the foolish death. I want you to find that for me. And if you could find me, Jesus, on the, when the enemy took him up to a high mountain, 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, that whole scripture. So even when we do an intercession, should we ask God how to pray for the person? I'm okay with laying a blanket statement out there. All I'm just all I'm doing is just showing you a different perspective is all I'm saying. So I'm not saying I'm not coming against anybody's doctrine, right? I believe in suffering the wish not to live. All I'm telling you is that we should always seek to have the heart of God concerning things. And typically, if you're given something to pray about, meaning if someone else gave it to you to pray about it, I just bank on that the groundwork has already been done. Or like if you're given a prayer assignment, the groundwork has already been done for that. So I'm not like trying to seek the heart of God on this, but meaning things that are on my desk by way of my own life and living before God and the people he's brought to me, I'm going to stop to get the heart of God for every single thing because all of it matters. I think he put it up there for you. All right, so what, hold on. You get, you, uh, which one is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't want you, I want you to read it, John, but I didn't want you to have to go look for two scriptures. YouTube, are y'all good? I hope this is helping you. Make sure y'all not sleep. Like Janika. Make sure y'all were good. Oh, hey, Donna, I, I thought she, I thought she was sleeping. <laughs> I didn't see her in there. I, I, the name could have went past, and I missed it. Well, I, t I tell you what, we'll come back to that in a second. John, go ahead and read the one that you have. So you see that? Should Abner have died the death of a fool's death? A fool's death is designed for wicked men. God never designed for righteous men to die a fool's death. Read it again. And just listen to what he's saying. Yeah, just that, pa that passage you just read. Mm -hmm. So there's a death that man can die, and it's because of his own foolishness. That was what he meant when he, re when he referenced the fool. Should he die like a fool? Should he die a fool's death? And he talks about the wicked. The wicked, that's their portion. So when you talk about how to pray, that's the portion that should befall them, not the righteous. Not the righteous. So when Elisha died, he didn't die a fool's death. He died of infirmity, but he didn't die the death of a fool. You see the difference? He didn't die the death that a fool should die. He died the death that God was transitioning from one state of existence to the next. Now when Jesus is up on a mountaintop and Satan says, cast yourself down and, and, and throw yourself down upon this. Find it. What, you got it? Which one was it? Read that for Matthew 4. Then 
Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yes. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands you they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against, against the stone. stone. Mm-hmm. Jesus said to him, It is it's written, written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, this is, remember, this is spiritual because when the devil took him up onto a high mountain, at no point in time is there any mountain that can show you all the kingdoms of the world. There's no mountain within this expanse of earth that you can see all the kingdoms in their vastness. So when he took him up, he took him up in the spirit. This wasn't that he took him up physically. Even when he took him up onto the pinnacle, that was spiritual also. So when he takes him up on the pinnacle, he says, throw yourself down and the angels will bear you up. Right? Because it's written, that's what the word of God says. But the word without the heart of God is not right. The word without the heart never works. So Satan has the word, but he doesn't have the heart. Satan has the word, but he doesn't have the heart. Jesus understands the heart of the Father. It is written that the angels will bear you up unless you dash your foot against the stone, meaning you bring this upon yourself. Jesus was saying, I'm not going to bring foolishness upon myself. That would have been a fool's death to assume that the angels will bear him up. That would have been a fool's death to assume that the angels will bear him up. So you have the death that's at the hands of God, you have the death that's the separation from existence, from that state of existence, then you have the death that's of the hands of a fool. And typically that fool is a man's self, right? It's kind of like I saw one of the guys on Instagram, he's a really heavy, 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 extremely heavy set guy, I'm talking. You said to me, he had to be like 400, 500 pounds, the guy on that motorcycle. And he like did a trick and like got up on the motorcycle. I cut the video off. I, I just knew he was going to die. I didn't even, I said, I don't want to see this. <laughs> and then I went back. I said, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I had to build up the courage to look at it. Because <laughs> I, I said, oh, he dead. Ain't no way. Ain't no way, my boy. <laughs> what do you say? Ain't no way, my boy. He, I said, oh, he out of there. Right? Surely a fool's death. Now, there's what we have to understand is that in that process, you need to know what God is doing. Is this someone that died a fool's death? Because it's most likely before time. Is this at God's hand where God is orchestrating his plans, his purposes? Or is this God simply transitioning a person from one state of existence to the next? Right? Because God can do it like he transitioned Elijah. He took him from one state of existence to the next. Like this. He transitioned who else? Enoch, with the snap of a finger, from one trans, from one place of existence, from one state of existence, to the next. Now it tells us about Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and he walked with God until he was what? No more. So, did Enoch taste of death, or did God transition him? Now, Enoch is a little bit different because Enoch only leaves men to two choices. Speak from experience or to speak from theory. Because there's not much written about him. So when a man speaks about Enoch, you're dealing with two, two, two schools of thought. One, a school of thought that this man knows something by virtue of experience. Or he's been taught something. Or 
the realm of just thought. And you have to know no meaning experience. I think it's Peter that he told he spoke about the woman and he said that these women are always learning, but they never come to the experience of knowledge. That's what he said. These women are always learning, but they never come to the experience of knowledge. And you have to ask God for the latter. It's not enough to learn. It's to come to the experience. Even in your learning, it's so that you can turn to God and say, God, I would like to know you in this way. You understand? I was talking with Alshonda, and I love my librarian. She, we were just discussing some things from the scriptures, and she asked me a question about it, and I was like, hey, um, it's, it's good. Some good, some not good. No, but not bad. And I, I just kind of highlighted some, and I said, well, go back to the drawing board on these things. And she's like, which parts? And I told her, I said, I don't want to rob you the opportunity to interact with God. If I just tell you information, it's just information. But if I can get you to wait on God, it may take you years. But the grace that comes with you waiting on God and now him coming to you and teaching you, whether that be through the angel of the Lord, whether that be through his Holy Spirit, whether that be he walk through the wall, whichever one, however it happens, if you can do that, you'll be able to always turn people to Jesus. Always. Always. So I told her, I said, I don't rob people of the opportunity to interact with God. I could easily teach you, like, no, that's wrong. This is why it's wrong. This is why it's wrong. Because remember, my encounter was that God would teach me things that I already experienced. I just didn't have the scriptures to teach them. So when God gives me the scriptures, I'm fully aware that now he's ready for me to teach people. You see? By the time he comes and teaches me the scriptures, that means it's time for me to start teaching it. Just like the school of meditation. I have the whole thing that he gave me over the last 18 months. Now it's time to teach it. But I've been sitting meditating for a long time. I've been being alone for a long time. Right? I didn't just start showing up by the banks of rivers. I was taught that. And then God gave me the scripture to teach it. Ezekiel was there standing by the banks of the river of Ule. And then he was caught up between the heaven and the earth in visions of God. You see? By the time God teaches me, it's now... Now, okay, now it's time for me to teach his people. I've been sitting on the trees for a long time. The trees are spiritual. I've been sitting on the trees for a very long time, waiting on God. Sitting by banks of river, meditating for a long time. And Isaac went out into the evening tide to meditate and sat there in the field, and then he lifted his eyes and saw her coming from afar. You see? Abraham sat in the tent of his door. <laughs> I, I had already knew that. I just finally got a way to teach it. So I was telling her, I said, what I don't do is rob people of the opportunity to encounter God. I never do that. It's easier to teach. Oh, I didn't even know this ran out. I'm sorry, y'all. We'll take a bathroom break in a second. YouTube, are y'all good? Or you want to cut it or we want to? I'm like, Paul. I can go home. I can stay here. It's just I haven't decided what I want to do yet. I love each one of you uniquely and deeply. Every last one of you, uniquely and deeply. I always pray for you. So that's what I was saying with Enoch, that when you hear a man talk about it, you need to know it's coming from two places. He's either connected to someone who's experienced something and they've taught him or they've experienced it or I'm sorry, or they're speaking from theory. And theory is not enough to speak about things that aren't expressly written. Theory is not enough to speak about things that are not expressly written. Now, the school of thought is what? God took Enoch, right? God took him. That's how it's been taught, but I'm going to teach you. Enoch died. Enoch died. Now, I'm trying to control myself because 
I remember being taught about it. But Enoch died. But if you speak from theory, you'll say God took him. But from experience, God did take him. And the way he took him was by him dying. You see that? When God takes a man, when I minister, I say, hey, man, God's ready to bring him home. What I'm saying, God is taking him from you. God is bringing him to himself. That's death. To be no more means to die. Enoch walked with God and he was what? No more. But then it talks about how and how she was weeping for her children because they were not or because they were no more. When a man is no more, it's because he has died. You understand? When a man is no more, it's because he has died. Enoch died. John, give me uh, Hebrews 11. <laughs> Zion said, how did he die? I'll be teaching that in a prophetic school this August. I told you guys going to give me the grace to teach about Enoch and Melchizedek, but I'm waiting until God says to go, and I believe that's the time he's going to let me teach it. And that won't be recorded. Because certain things have to be treasured. They can't be made common. Yeah, start the list because we got a long list for February too. I asked Kevin now, trying to help me and uh, keep me. You got it? Yeah. Let's go to um, when it talks about Abraham and how Abraham, by faith, Abraham went to a place that he did not know, that whole thing. Thank you. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Remember I told you that tent represents a place of establishment, but not permanent. Mm -hmm. That's why this body is a tent. So although he was in the promised land, he dwelt in what? Tents. He was in the physical place that God promised him, but he was still inside of a tent, which means the place that God promised him was beyond Canaan. You get it? I'm going to teach you this year. Go ahead. The heirs with him of the same promise. promise. Mm -hmm. For he waited for the city which has You see that? So I just, the scriptures tell you, but I just taught it to you. God called him out to a place that he did not know. By faith, he dwelt in the land promise in tents as a stranger. God promised him Canaan. That was the physical place that they would possess. That's where he was at, but he was inside of a tent. But it says, by faith, he waited for a city who had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. Remember, he was possessing places that were already established by other men. So he's looking for a greater city, a city who has pillars, who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Go ahead. Sate, Vake, Bebe. Thank you, Lord. Whose builder and maker is God. Yes. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. Yes. When she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, for one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Yes. Keep on. I'm looking for something. These all died. Oh, hold on. All right, go back. Okay, you you too early. Go back two verses before we started. Uh-uh, uh-uh. From where you started at, by faith, Abraham went to a land. Go back about two, three verses before that. Please. Yeah. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as inheritance. Hold on, go, go back, go back uh, again. Get, 
What what verse is what verse is that one? No, that's verse eight. Go back to five. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Start at five. Yeah. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. All right. So by faith, what does it say? Enoch was taken Right now, go ahead and read that entire passage of scripture. Read through Abraham, everybody. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that, that he, he is, is, and that he, he is, is a rewarder for so those who seeking. diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Yes. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. As in a foreign country, mm -hmm. dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Oh, Y'all stay with me. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Yes. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength and she to, bore. Conceive, to conceive seed. Mm -hmm. And she bore a child when she was past the age. Yes. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Who gave the promise, that's right. Therefore, from one man in him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude. Yep, and the sands of the seashore. As the same which is by the seashore. Yes. These all died in faith. So these all did what? Die. These all did what? Say it again. Paul told us these all died in faith. That includes Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken by God. That he did not see death. It didn't say he did not experience it. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, Sarah did this. By faith, these did this. These all have died not having received the promise. He said it's always right there in my face. Remember, this is spiritual. It's kind of like when I taught you about John. If any man goes to try to find John, you won't be able to see him. It's veiled. That's what the prophetic does. It brings light and it unveils. I'm a teacher, but I'm a prophet. So when I teach both graces merge together, it's right there, but you couldn't see it all along. You couldn't see it all along. <clears throat> That's because this is spiritual. This is spiritual. Enoch died. Like I said, I'll teach you more about Enoch in another time, but what happened was Enoch transitioned from one state of existence to the next because he pleased God in such a deep and profound way that God wanted him to himself. So he had to transition him from one state of existence to the next. Remember, these things are, these things are different, man. These things are different. I was, John was reading it, but I saw Carl had put it up there. That's the grace to see and experience to understand. I mean, probably like every other day, Carl sends me some, some beautiful passage of scripture, and he sees things that others won't. I mean, I know, I know what people most times can see, and they see things that I know most people can't see. So I know grace is working. I know grace is working. Because I don't have to be like, hey, sit down and let me give you grace. Grace is connected when you connect. I don't even have to give it. Some people can take it if they know how to do it. Remember I told you taking it by force? I don't never tell John nothing. 
It don't matter what God gave me. I'm going to make sure you have it. It's spiritual. You understand what I'm saying? So this one day I want to take a restroom break. I want us to give. So that way we don't forget. Because I do not forget about it. Take a restroom break. And then I want to teach about Enoch. But it's not time. So what we'll do is. We're going to um, pick up. And I'm going to teach you about John and Elijah. And the souls of men. And I love you. Just You too. Hold on. Let's make sure they're good Jalen. You too. Be all good. I want to make sure you all there. Or do y'all want to. Um... I know everybody got to go to bed and stuff. They're tired. You know. Mother's hanging in there by a thread. Quentin said, oh, yes, Antoine, thumbs up, Justin, thumbs up. We here, all good. MG, Pat, Zion, fine. <laughs> Teach, do we here? No. <laughs> That's my desire to walk with God, so I'm no more. All right, perfect. So we're going to give. Give me five minutes to use the restroom, and then we'll be right back. I'm going to teach about the souls of men. Go ahead, Jalen. You're good now. you read it and let it open up the truth you would find out it would open up everything inside of you but everybody wants to be put on how you even making all these songs like how you get the money how you get the fame but why don't you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings though i pay attention i'm listening to your lingo who i serve he got eyes like an ego he see everything i promise you won't get away with not anything no. yeah that's a cold hot truth I'm being honest Don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my steps So I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true You can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey They would love me But what does it matter If he ain't rooting for me God help me What the fuck yeah. Can't do this alone God
Behind the diamond rings, though. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego. He see everything. I promise you won't get away with not anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> But that's a cold hard truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mood. He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I true. You can't see it. That's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me. What the fuck? Yeah. Can't do this alone. God help me. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the fuck? Yeah. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the fuck? Yeah. God bless me. Can't do this alone. God bless me. So I'm here. I'm like, no, you're not. No, I'm fine. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you guys for your patience. I needed to uh I needed to relieve myself, so I appreciate you guys. Now, we left off <clears throat> and I was talking to you about Enoch. And I said that when you start talking about certain things that aren't expressly written, there's two types of experiences you have. One that's just an experience from someone gathering their own conclusions. And one that's so much truly been taught of God. And you need to always desire the other. <laughs> the latter, okay? <laughs> I want to make sure I said <laughs> the latter right one. You need to always desire the latter. Because that is what brings you grace to come into and experience something. That was grace to just show you that, like, it's there the entire time in plain sight. How many times have you read that? And you run around saying, hey, you knock, you knock, so, 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 which is nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. 
Because even then, remember I said every man stands on his mountain. But his mountain is all on the same mountain. So it's not that I'm on the mountain and then the pastor on a totally different mountain. And then the evangelist is like, no, we're on the same mountain. Mountains have hips and they have valleys, different peaks. We're at different points, but we're on the same mountain, the mountain of God. But depending upon where we are determines our vantage. And each vantage is right. You see? So even in that, I'm not discounting or downplaying anything that you've heard. So don't chalk, chalk anybody hard if you hear them say, Enoch never died, right? They, they're giving an understanding of it. Right? It says that Enoch did not see death. He didn't. God took him. And the other thing is, every man that's in Christ doesn't see death either. Every man that's in Christ doesn't see death. The physical body has to go through a state of transition, but meaning when it gets to that point, the crossover, right? The crossover, they don't experience that. It's literally like you pop from one dimension into the other side. That's what it's like when every man in Christ dies. The man outside of Christ, I can't speak for. But the man in God, the man in Christ, when that tent finally rots and fades away, it's, I can't explain it. Just you, you, you just jump to the other. You like it's like a space bridge. You jump from one side to the next. If I started explaining it, it would be like real weird. It, the the symbolism I would have to use to explain it, because a lot of times when you experience certain things, you don't have much to compare it to, and then the things that you have closest to compare it to, you don't want to say openly, mm -hmm. right? So you just have to be like. It's kind of like this without saying it. But remember I said, I said, uh, remember when we were at the, the last school and I said, hey, yeah, man, they, they take it right out of the movies. Mm -hmm. There's one set of group that makes certain movies that just seem to take certain things out that just make a lot of sense. <coughs> you just take that and read between the lines and put it where you want to put it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Remember someone tried to tell me that Enoch got raptured. I had something in my spirit just now. That information was out. See, but even in that, even in that, a certain part of it's right. And so Peter says Enoch got raptured. A certain part, a certain part is right. Because all rapture means means to be caught up to God. That's all. That's all it is, just to be called up to God. The only difference is in the rapture where Jesus comes to return for us is that we will be caught up and we will be changed in a moment. And we will be like him. That's the only difference. But even then, the dead in Christ rise first. So even in that, there's certain dynamics to it in light of who, who enters in which order. That makes sense? Yeah. So that was... Um, a little about Enoch. We'll, we'll talk more about Enoch as the as the year goes on. As the year goes on, God will give us more grace, and we'll talk more about it. And um, we'll talk about a lot. We'll talk about a lot of stuff this year. I'm looking forward to it. Now, when we talk about oh, just real quick too, can y'all hear me well? Because I I did move the mic around. I see you holding it up. Let me know if I'm good. Yeah, y'all give me some thumbs up real quick if y'all gave me that. I know we rocking. Thank you all so much for your patience. Perfect. Now, <coughs> hey, Melissa, we owe each other a phone call. If you could um, text me tomorrow and let's, let's figure out how we can hook up on Thursday. I was slammed, but I hadn't forgot about you. He said it did get quiet a bit. I'm just not a loud, loud speaking person, so I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I'm just not a loud. <laughs> I'm just not a loud guy. Yeah, I'm just a, you know, I just don't. <laughs> just not my flow. <laughs> now I preach and I get, I can get passionate, but yeah, I'm just not a loud person. 
Now we pray I can I get out. <laughs> we cast some devils out, I get out. <laughs> and I thought he was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell him to take it by force. I know. <laughs> I was standing up then when I'm sitting down, it's time to teach and just have our spirits together, be collected, be calm, be reserved. I said, yeah, go ahead and put the chair out so that way we can just ease into the new year. <laughs> we're going to have a table back in a few weeks, though. <laughs> Those light bees ain't quiet. <laughs> Hit you in your, in your shana now. <laughs> hey, you deep in your spirit. What? Remember, Janika said, "What is happening to me right now?" <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> you know, people say, "What is going on to me?" <laughs> Esco said, "Can you see?" Oh, perfect. That's all right. Esco, do me a favor. Retype your question because it's about to roll off my TV on the monitor. That way, I can answer it. <coughs> Can you see in the spiritual realm when you're getting ready to die? My father, days before he died, I caught him talking to someone that wasn't there and also reaching to grab something that wasn't there. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that. Kevin said during the deliverance on the trap of sexual sin, when you yelled, I almost transitioned <laughs> to the last <laughs> It's one of those things, man. I... At as, as certain times, I turn into a madman. I do. At a certain, at a certain moment, at a certain time, I just turn into a madman. And you know, just know that's God working through me at that point. Because <laughs> that's, that's not my natural nature. <laughs> Meaning just character. <laughs> Kevin anointed to tell the truth and make it funny. <laughs> That brother said, I almost, I almost came to the life to come. <laughs> I think some other people felt like that, too. Yeah. I want uh, him to put his question back up there, and we'll start there. I'm going to teach you about the souls of men. I'll teach you a little bit about the life to come. If he doesn't do it in like 30 seconds, somebody scroll back and read it to me. If it, Give him a second, though. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. Kevin, are we going to stand up at the gate? <laughs> no, we're going to make sure he elevated a little a better position in that. So Esco said, can you see in the spiritual realm when you're getting ready to die? My father, days before he died, I caught him talking to someone that wasn't there and also reaching to grab something that wasn't there. Perfect. So remember I told you that death is a transition from one state of existence to the next. And what happens is the closer we draw, the closer we draw to that state of transition, Let's say um, this is the state of transition and we're about to cross that dimension. The closer we draw to that state of dimension, that which is on the other side becomes more visible and more real than what's here. So the closer we draw to that, the more that world can be seen, the more that the entities and beings in that world also can be seen. And then also the more we start to interact with them sometimes too. Now I can only speak for those who are in Christ. <clears throat> I can't speak for those who <clears throat> are outside of God because there are some different things that happen to them. I know of some things, but I don't know the totality of these things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I know of some things, but I don't know it in its fullness. I only know about what I've experienced. But in light of those who are in Christ, when they begin to transition that state of existence, what happens is there are escorts that are brought to them. And a lot of times... There are angelic beings that are also brought, but there's also family members that are brought. If they have then been in right standing with God and also exist within the life to come that we're going. 
and God will allow those family members, <clears throat> excuse me, to escort us over into the life to come. And the reason being, the family members represent peace. The family members also represent a way of transitioning where you know things are well. Because if you, most people, if you've never seen an angelic being and then they show up to escort you, that could, t that could cross you over faster just because, I mean, and honestly, <laughs> I'm serious. It could, it, could, it could transition you so fast because of how startling it is, right? So God will allow family, even friends at times, to come and be with you. And when they're there with you, they're not there to hang out. They're there to bring you home. And they help begin the facilitating process of you crossing over. So then you can see people a lot of times, like he said, his father may start talking or they may start reaching for things, right? Hold on, I remember my flash on. Mm hmm Amen. <laughs> Ty is crazy. Talking about fear not, then they scared me all the way to death. <laughs> Yo, what we gonna do? <laughs> this brother is crazy. But literally what happens is in that transition, like spirits that are like you in nature come to aid you. Now for the wicked, for the man separate from God, the man who rails against God, the man who's different from us, right? Like spirits that they have served will come and get them and take them. Literally, dark spirits will come, they will show up, and they will escort you because you've been serving and ministering at their altars all this time. So they're the ones that transition you. And that experience is not good. That experience is not good. That is a death that you actually taste and you actually see. Not good. That's what Jesus was talking about when he talked about that those who keep this book, the word of this book of this law, they shall not taste of the second death. That's what that second death is like. You feel it, you see it, you taste it, you experience it. <laughs> so that sounds horrible. It is. Don't. The more you mess around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the more you gonna find out. So don't mess around. Hey Amen. Don't mess around. But you don't have to worry because your names are written in the last book of life. Not they will be. The one whom God saves, he was already predestined to be with God. Him whom he foreknew, he predestined that he would be changed into the image of the Son of God. Yeah. I don't know when, but we'll teach about predestination soon. Just help people just un understand some things. You didn't choose God, he chose you. Everything that happened made you think he chose God. But it was all to his divine providence of him drawing a man to himself. The entire thing is about a man being drawn to himself. Life and death. Death is about man being drawn to him. Life is about man being drawn to him. The whole thing is about him. And the only way we have him is through his son. You understand? Life is about being drawn to God. Death is about being drawn to God. He is the one who draws a man to himself. Everything is about the Son of God. You hear me say that? It don't matter if we're talking about Melchizedek. It don't matter if we're talking about Noah. It don't matter if we talk about Abraham. All of it goes back to the Son of God because all things exist from him. Hebrew says there's nothing that was made without him that was made, meaning nothing exists without him. All of it comes from him. That's why he is the one that has the preeminence is what the scriptures say. That makes sense? Yes, he is the one that has the preeminence. Now, in light of that, he asked about, you know, how that transition process. That's just one of those things. But in order to talk more about that, we have to understand truly what it is about the souls of men. Because the souls of men, it, remember I told you before when I was teaching, I said man exists in different realms, right? Remember I said, I said you have the physical realm, you have the spiritual realm, you have the soulish realm. Man exists in those different realms. And as man exists in those different realms, what happens is you're unaware.
But now when you get the center of the teachings, you become more aware. And becoming more aware helps you be enlightened. And when you're enlightened, you don't have to fear. And you don't have to fret about these things, right? So in light of that, when we talk about death before time, in light of the souls of men, a lot of people don't realize that not every person transitions to their eternal resting immediately when they die. So most people imagine that when a man dies, he immediately is before the judgment seat of Christ, and then he gets his judgment, and that's it. I'll tell you that there are a lot of people that don't even get to appear before Christ. There are a lot of souls that never even make it to the judgment seat. And I'll tell you, more people arrive to the judgment seat to receive where they shall rank and reside within heaven than to be dismissed from heaven. More people show up to the judgment seat and are given their assignment where they shall reside, those sorts of things, their rewards at the judgment seat than those who are dismissed. I didn't say everybody, but I said more. More. Because remember, not everyone appears before judgment of Christ because when some people die, the like spirits that they minister to grab them before they ever even go. They literally, they come and they grab them. And they drag them, what I would call headlong. Any spiritual man would know what I'm talking about. They drag them headlong into the lower realms of darkness. Any man who has experienced what I'm talking about, they'll use very similar language with what I'm saying. Like spirits will come and they will drag them headlong. And then there's other men who have practiced darkness for so long that their own souls have been darkened. So because their souls have been darkened, when they have any exposure to light, they cast themselves headlong into the lower realms of darkness because their souls can't withstand the light. Their souls can't withstand the light. Remember I told you one day I'll teach about the mercies of God? When I tell you most people don't have a clue. I gave a hint, and not in a bad way. When I say most people don't have a clue, I don't mean in a bad way. I don't mean in a bad way at all. But I gave a hint when I said that from the days of Noah, Jesus descended into the lower ranks of hell. And from the days of Noah, he went and ransomed everybody all the way up until then. There's some mercies and things that everyone doesn't quite understand. Unless you get to look into his eyes of mercy. You understand? So judgment isn't something to be feared. Because he is the one that is full of mercy. Remember, he's our high priest. We have a high priest who is not out of touch with our feelings. You got to remember that. We have a high priest who is not out of touch with our feelings. The one who worked to have me drawn to himself isn't looking to cast me away from him. He's looking to draw me to himself. I have my part. I have to play in it also. Okay. Without holiness, no man shall see. Don't don't do that. Like, don't do that again. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, don't do that because your mom worked hard on your hair. What was I saying? God, God invested the blood of himself in his son for man to be reconciled to himself. God's not interested in just taking losses on the, on the sheet, on the books. God's not just interested in just accepting else. You understand? So even in that, we don't fully understand the predestination. Hold on, let me, let me see if I can find the scripture for you. Y'all hold on one second. Let me look for this. All right, here we go. Listen to this. I won't tell you what it is, but just listen. That they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, 
beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by to which he called you by our gospel. Again, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. Paul was telling them, although you have been called by my gospel, God chose you before I was even a minister of the gospel. That's what Paul was telling you. Before God chose me, he had already chosen you for salvation. He called you to salvation. Through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel. Now listen to this one. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord, our, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Remember, this is a state of existence. Whether I'm awake or I'm asleep, if I'm with him, I'm not dead. That he chose that we should be with him. He didn't appoint us to wrath, but he called us unto himself. So a lot of times, like I said, there are things that everyone just doesn't quite get. And it's not a bad thing. So I'm not, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not speaking against anybody. Now, when we talk about the souls of men. There's not every everyone doesn't appear before the judgment seat of Christ at the same time. There are some men who die in the flesh and their souls have to roam. Until the return of Christ. That's a part of judgment. Also, there are some souls that are roaming today right now. In certain places, you can go to certain places and there's plenty of souls. They're just trapped. Trapped and can't move. There was a movie. And I, I never saw it personally. I just saw the trailer for it. But it was where the gentleman had got, he was kidnapping children. And he was always murdering them. And every time he murdered someone, there were, um, he said poltergeists are real. You want to know how I learned about poltergeists? You remember that? I did. I never see like I'm gonna tell you when God deals me in a unique way. So I never knew what poltergeist was. Never heard the word. Didn't know none of that stuff. Right. And one night <coughs> we're in this new house. We moved into a new house. When we're in the new house, the lights start going off crazy in the hallway. And it and it wasn't just that. Like it wasn't like a flick, flick, flick. It was a very violent. It was violence is what I perceived the moment I saw the lights going off. It was it was it was this immense amount of wrath and violence with it, and I said, and I remember looking, and Felicia was sleeping, so I was like, "Well, I'm not gonna wake her because she's not in a bad way, scary, so she gonna freak out like she gonna go lose her mind." Like, I was like this, I was like, "Okay," and I'm looking, at, yeah, she. I mean, you're less scary now, but you was really scary then, and so um, it was bad, <laughs> so. And I can't explain it. It was so violent. And I knew that it wasn't just a short in the electricity. I knew it wasn't just, I knew. And I said, man, there's souls trapped in here. Right? And then the Lord came to me and said, we have to deal with the poltergeist. I didn't know what poltergeist was. And that's how, it was a word I didn't know. And then he taught me about it. And then later on, I physically learned about it. So I tell you, God, God is very consistent with how he deals with me. He knows. That's why I told someone, I said, um, I'm dealing with something right now. And I said, well, God knows how to speak to me if he wants to fix it. Mm-hmm. He knows the way he's going to have to speak to me. Yeah. He, he and I have an agreement about things. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I'll be here waiting because he knows how he interacts with me. Mm-hmm. He knows. And it's going to take a miracle. It's going to take a miracle from God. <laughs> You remember that? If God don't do it, it won't get done. If God don't do it, it won't get done. <laughs> if God don't do it, it's going to take a miracle from God. <laughs> Literally, they say, go and start praying in tongues. <laughs> right? 
I, look, I had that happen. I remember. I remember. <clears throat> I was in the hotel room one night, right? And when I was in the hotel room, I had just finished casting a bunch of devils out of this, this gentleman. And when I went to sleep, I went into a trance. Right before I fell asleep, I went to this trance. And so then when I came out of the trance, I knew there was something else that entered the room. And so I'm like, so when I went into this trance, the portal that I entered in, when I came out of the spirit followed out of it behind me. And then he started messing with all the lights in that room. And I said, well, I know not to, uh, I know not to wake my wife up. <laughs> no, this was, that was a different time when you experienced it. That was a different time. She experienced it again when I went back to the same hotel. Yeah. So, <laughs> but there's, so, there's, remember I told you that there's souls that aren't, there's souls that roam. There's more than just what meets the eye, is what I'm saying. There's a lot of spiritual dynamics that people just don't fully know. But they say, and then the spirit is in the room, and I see it. And you're talking about scary. Mm -hmm. And I remember I said, don't repeat me. But I said, nigga, I fear God. And then I wouldn't put the covers over my head and went to bed. <laughs> 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 I literally, I said, nigga, I fear God. <laughs> and I put the cup. Now, mind you, I put the covers over my head for a reason. <laughs> if I was really about it, I would have just, uh, I would have left the covers. I said, nigga, I fear God. <laughs> and then I laid down. And I was under my cover of Rambandi, Kelebe, Kebrondo, Luka, Madaba. Hey! <laughs> I, Sean and Kevin hadn't given me my African impartation, so my power wasn't as strong then. I, nah, I, <laughs> I would have known better. I would have. I was just doing warfare in my prayer closet and my life started doing that and I didn't think anything of it until just now they stopped spoke properly so after I got done praying in tongues amen that just happened last night yeah so even in that when I, when I, I talk about just make a light, light a little bit but that that specific day was where the angel of the Lord came to teach me about ministering with water that was the same time where he came to teach me about that. That same encounter was where the angel was with me. He was teaching me about water. So it was a whole lot of activity happening. It was a whole lot of stuff happening. All these devils coming out of this. I love it. I remember the guy was screaming, they're not leaving me. He screamed at the top of his lungs. I said, well, don't worry. We both getting kicked out because we both leaving in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I ended up saying. I said, well, don't worry. They're going to be with you, but I'm leaving too. Cause we finna get put out, <laughs> and thank God the angel of the Lord was with me, and God's grace was strong to deliver. But during that count, a lot of stuff was happening. But in light of that, souls can roam. Can a lost soul end up possessing people? Not necessarily. But there's I, I can't get in that tonight because there's too many dynamics. But when you start dealing on the the side of dark magic, witchcraft, and things. They capture spirits and they use them for they use their powers and put them in people. There's all kind of stuff. There's all kind of stuff. Way more than what meets the eye. So, but a soul itself doesn't end up possessing people. No. A soul itself does not end up possessing people. But in light of that, you um have souls that roam. You have souls that roam. You have souls that literally roam. Ezekiel was talking about it when he says that the hunter of souls. Find it for me, John. Oh, Kevin just put up Ezekiel even talking. Kevin, put it up in the chat if you find it first. YouTube, is this good? Y'all help? Y'all good? Where 
will wrap up here in a second. Never mind. We ain't even got to talking about assignments yet. He put it in there, Ezekiel 13, 20. Is it pertaining to... Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's what I was. I, that's what I was gonna say. No, all right, hold on. So, that's what I was trying to say about the movie. The poltergeist comment took me away from it. But in the movie, the souls of all the little boys and girls that he had murdered were inside of the house. So every time he brought someone there, the souls were trying to help the person that the next kidnapped person get out. So the souls like he's. You have to go this way. Because each one had got further along. So the souls were trying to help the, the person. Now, I've never seen it, obviously. I just don't <laughs> go looking at murder, rage, wrath, violence. I'm just not going to watch demons on TV. But <laughs> the trailer, I, I understood what they were saying on the trailer spiritually, is what I'm saying. I saw it and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I understood it. But inside of the house, everywhere that they, they were helping, like, hey, under here is a trap door go this way there's this people further along were helping the souls were trapped in that house so in that sometimes when <coughs> sometimes not every time because I'm not speaking definitive but there are times where the souls of men die in the earth and when they die a certain way they end up trapped for a certain period of time and the souls end up roaming here here in the earth that's why we say things on our casket like what? R.I.P. That's where that came from. You're saying rest in peace because that person has no peace because they're Roman. You want to put rest in peace for me because I'm going to be in my home. What is it? With whether I'm sleep or whether I'm sleep or awake, I am with my Lord. I don't need to rest in peace. I'm with peace. The person of peace. There is no peace without him. So they say what? Rest in peace. You see that? R.I.P. Now I'm not I'm not making semantics on whether you put R.I.P. on your cat, all of that kind of stuff. But you know, Ray Ray and them been cutting a fool, acting a monkey, mm -hmm. shooting everybody up. Now you like R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because you know there's no peace. You see what I'm saying? You know there's no peace. The only peace is with the Prince of Peace. Peace is only found with the person who can give it. Peace can only be found with the one who orchestrated it. If I'm not taking in a rapture, my tombstone is going to say first class ticket to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> May you win many souls even at the grave. I pray people tell your story one day. <laughs> I really do. Now, in light of the souls of men, <laughs> Ray Ray out here roaming. A lot of times, <laughs> we're going to make sure Justin and Kevin don't sit next to each other. <laughs> we're giving them the side seats. <laughs> but you'll get a break from reading because Kevin helped us read during the class. <laughs> all, all of them. All of them, okay? Now, in light of that, when I talk about Souls of Roma, when you've heard me say this, that a lot of times we make blanket statements and blanket judgments in light of things without definitive 
answers about them, like suicide. Nowhere in the word of God does it definitively express that a man who commits suicide is condemned to hell. There's nowhere in the word of God that explicitly expresses it. We can gather conclusions towards things based upon the scriptures, but it's not expressly stated. Right? It's not expressly stated. Now here's teaching you what I know. It's not expressly stated, so I'm not saying one way or the other. What I do know is that there are mercies that exist beyond what the people preach about people committing suicide don't know. He said, there go that Judas doctrine. Judas cast himself, what, headlong. But Judas also would say that if he knew for the purposes in which he was born, he would have never, he would have chose not to be born. He was preordained and predestined for that purpose, to fulfill his what? Assignment. And when a man has successfully fulfilled what he is to do, you don't understand what mercy looks like on the other side. When a man has successfully completed what he was tasked and created for, you don't know what mercy looks like on the other side. Like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar experienced judgment and Nebuchadnezzar went on to serve God. And quiet for the rest of his days after his judgment. After he experienced what he experienced. So, I'm saying to say, people, we just don't know everything, including myself. We don't, we don't know everything, you know. What I said, what I used to say, you don't know. <laughs> Shay likes it when I say that, but I'm trying, I'm trying to stop saying that. <laughs> it's not humble. So I'm trying to be better in 2024. <laughs> I'm trying, amen. But I'm just gonna say, perhaps. That that feels better, right? I'm learning my lesson. Perhaps. There's more than what meets the eye. Now, in light of suicide, I can tell you what I know. That there are souls that end up trapped roaming after they commit suicide. And they get stuck in what's called the soul realm. Now, there's one movie that has an implication of this place. Right? There's one movie that has an implication of this place. Yon, uh, the Infinity War. And he sent everybody to what they what they call the soul realm. Now they had it wrong in how they try to portray it, but the soul realm is a real place. It's a real, ex- it's a real state of existence. Remember, I told you that death is about transitioning from states of existence. The soul realm is a real state of existence where men get trapped. Real, I know it because I've been there. One of my journeys there, the Lord Jesus came and took me there. Remember I told you how he took me to hell? The day before he took me to the soul realm. And that's where he taught me about it. That's how I was able to help Natasha. Because I understood where she was. So I was like, okay. I got it. I understand now. That's how I was able to help. But then again, if I were to speak definitively and I would have my heart shut off based upon doctrine I would have missed that lesson from Jesus because I would have thought I was there would have been no reason for him to speak with me right? if you know everything there he has nothing to teach you he says come and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know not that I will show you things that you don't know that you do know I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know that's why you have to be like a child You have to be like a child inside of this kingdom. You want to interact with angels? Be like a child. You want to interact with God? Be like a child. You want to interact with the Lord Jesus? Be like a child. That's what he said when they when they were all going back and forth. And he says, all right, come here. Come here. You see these kids? Bring bring one of them here. Be like this little child here. For, For theirs is the kingdom. For their angels see the face of my father all the time. Their angels were different angels than some of the angels that you have with you. Why? Because they don't know. So their heart's position is open and humble and willing to receive and willing to learn. You know what I mean? (coughs) (coughs) Excuse me. Hold on one second. John, give me Revelation 2.
Yeah, but just just kind of put your thumb there so we can come to it as I come down this street. Now, we're talking about the souls of men. So we have the souls of men, but we also have the spirits of men. So remember, there's a difference. You have the souls of men, but you also have the spirits of men. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the souls of men, when man transitions from his state of existence and death, if he is separated from God, the spirit leaves his body. That spirit goes and returns back inside of God. Literally just whoop, back inside of the father. And the only thing left is their soul. The physical body rests in the earth. That's why I said, remember, man exists in different realms. If anyone has a problem, not a problem, but even just in contesting, consider consider that alone. <clears throat> when a man dies, his body goes into the grave. His soul is either with God or in hell. His spirit, if he's in hell, goes back to God. That's three different places. All at the same time. You see that? That's three different realms. The realm of men, the realm of hell or the realm of souls, and it's out of the God realm back inside of God all at one time so it's not strange when I say hey man man exists in different realms it's just more than what we understand you got it so you have the souls of men but you also have the spirits of men now I'm going to have to speak to you in code a little bit and you're just going to have to put your spiritual thinking caps on it you're going to have to have the mind of Christ so you can perceive what it is I'm saying and if you have ears of the spirit, you can hear what I'm saying. Find me uh, in Hebrews where it talks about we have come to Mount Zion, John. So you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. So first thing, the mountain is a place. Not only is the mountain is a place, but if there's a city, there's systems inside of that city. So when you start hearing me this year teaching about the technology of heaven, I'm not just making up stuff. Every city has a system and a structure that causes it to function. If is if it is not advanced enough inside of its technological advancements, shout out to Mbaku. We have watched and we have listened from the mountains <laughs> as your technological advancements <laughs> have been overseen by a child who scoffs at tradition. We will not have it. Nope. What are you doing here, Baku? It's challenge day. It's challenge day. What? You did not know we read books? Mafa! <laughs> That's what I'm about to start doing when I do deliverance. Mafa! <laughs> you understand? <laughs> now, he says that we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. A mountain is not a city. Mountains exist within inside of a city, but mountains are not cities. If there's a city, there are citizens there. If there's a city, there are structures there. Buildings, roadways. Does that feel better, sister? What happened? Oh, hey, fam. Oh, man. Get some rest, get better. God will help you. I'm sorry. 
We with you too, my sister. I was wondering. I thought I, I said we ain't got no scriptures popping up. <laughs> yeah, get better, our sister. We love you deeply. We have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. If there's a city, there's structures. If there's structures, there's roadways. There's you know when you inside of your city, there's a water system. Then there's a sewer system. Then there's an electrical system. You see what I'm saying? There's all of these systems. There's a roadway system. All of these systems that cause that city to function optimally. So inside of the mountain is the city. And I'll teach you more about that in the days to come this year. Now go ahead and pick back up. Oh, man, we out of time. I'm playing. I got y'all. As long as y'all good, I'm good. What? The heavenly Jerusalem. So there's a Jerusalem in the earth, but then there's a Jerusalem in the heavens. All right. You have come unto Mount Zion, the heavenly, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Go ahead, continue. An company of angels. To how many? So it doesn't matter that he took a third. You still can't count him. So we rave on saving Satan taking the third, but he says that inside of Mount Zion, you can't count the angels that are there. To an innumerable company of angels. Go ahead. To the general assembly. To the general assembly and church. church. Of the firstborn who are restful in heaven. To God, the judge of all. To the spirit of just man made perfect. Okay, so let's we had the souls of men, but we also have what? The spirits of men. Now, he said that we have come to Mount Zion. Every man hasn't been there, but every man can go there. We have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the host, the innumerable company of angels, to the church of the firstborn, to our God, who is the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. He didn't say the souls of men. Remember I told you when a man dies in Christ, he retains his spirit. When a man dies in Christ, he retains his spirit. He didn't say the souls of men. He said the spirits of just men that have been made perfect. The perfection happens in Christ. So the spirits of just men being made perfect. Now, if men don't understand the dynamic of the spirits of men, you'll never understand that you can interact with them also. But then what they will say is that that's necromancy. Right? And necromancy is when you interact with the dead. But God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of what? The living. Because a man, if he's in Christ, he never truly dies. He just simply transitions from one state of existence to the next. Whether I'm asleep or awake, my life is in Christ, is what Paul said. Whether I am asleep or awake, my life is in Christ. So we have the souls of men, but then you also have the spirits of men. We have come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God. A numerous amount of angels, the church of the first, the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, the God who is the judge of men, the spirits of just men made perfect. So you have just men and they have been made perfect, but those men are called spirits. The spirits of just men made perfect because a man and his spirit is not the same thing. That's why he said the spirits of those men. Remember I told you when a man dies, they say what? Here lies the body of this person. Why? Why? Because the body is not who they truly are. Their soul is who they truly are. But if they're in Christ, their soul and their spirit are retained together. So then people don't realize that there are certain things that I wish I could truly tell you how I learned certain things. But people would people would just you don't even understand. But you have come to Mount Zion. I'm just repeating it, hoping you get it. 
the spirits of just men made perfect. If you can be there, you can interact with them. You understand what I'm saying? If you can be there, you can interact with them, but you're not interacting with the dead. God said, I am not the God of the dead, but the God of the lit. Find that for me, John. <laughs> oh, hey, Ashton, I love you. I love you, Elder Ashton. You want to know how Paul knew certain things? The spirits of just men made perfect. There are certain things that Paul knew. The spirits of just men were made perfect. You got it, John? Go ahead, put, read it for me real quick. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. So he says that you're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures or the power thereof. Go ahead. For when they were rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given, given in marriage. Life. They're not angels, but they're like angels. So people mix that up too. They're, they're not angels. We're not angels. We're made like them. Go ahead. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read the book of Moses in the burning bush passage? How God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead. But the God of the living, you are therefore greatly mistaken. So he says, "What? Well, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob." He didn't say, "I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac, and I was the God of Jacob." Was would imply that they are no longer living. Was implies that they're no longer serving him. He says, "I am the God of Abraham." I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of your fathers, your forefathers. He's telling them that they're not dead. They may be asleep, but in Christ, no man truly dies. In Christ, no man truly dies. So he, Jesus was trying to bring them into something, but they could not, could not break past this thing. That six-pound thing in between ears, they could not break free from it. Because you don't serve God with that, you serve him with this. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then there's another passage where he says, I am the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He was telling them that these men are very much alive. These men are very much alive, which is why Jesus can go to the mountain of transfiguration and Elijah and Moses can appear to him there. The reason they can appear to him is because these are the spirits of just men that have been made perfect. So you think that Jesus took them up on any regular mountain. He took them up on Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. They think he just carried them up a mountain. It looked like it was physical. And he says, what? Make sure you don't tell your brothers nothing about this until I have risen. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The spirits of just men made perfect. Remember I told you it's the duty of past prophets to minister to current prophets. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about past prophets like He's 80, and now he ministers to me because I'm 30. No. It's the duty of past prophets to minister to current prophets. It's the duty of past prophets to minister to current prophets. That's why you could hear me say, light be. I learned that from somewhere. You can't open your concordance and read that anywhere. You can't. I dare you to try it. Open your Hebrew, your Greek, your all of that. And I love that stuff. So I'm not I'm not speaking against that. But I'm saying meaning the revelation that comes from that, you can't find that. You can only find a few men that talk about it. It's kind of like when I spoke about heaven and I said, Hey, the children there play 
and there's these sounds and there's these colors and you hear it and there's all these things that are happening. You can only find a few people that talk about those things. But I too was taught that. Just like Enoch was also a prophet. But you can't read anywhere that Enoch was a prophet. You can't read... You won't find anything. Only thing you have about Enoch is that he walked with God until he was no more. Right? <laughs> we walk with God until no more. He said, so what's the difference between our forefathers who are still alive and Melchizedek? Melchizedek is not of our forefathers. Melchizedek is a entity. Melchizedek is an entity. And like I said, I can't, I'm just not going to teach about until God gives me the grace. But remember, there's rank and order inside of spiritual dynamics. Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Mm -hmm. But then when you rank Michael, it says Michael, the prince. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, the prince. That's a rank. These are, this, this is spiritual stuff. I can't, that, that, that's big boy talk. We, we talk about that in private. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's spiritual. <clears throat> it's spiritual, but the spirits of just men made perfect. But send me a text message, Carl. I'll give you a little something to chew on tonight. I got you. <laughs> send me a text message. I'll give you something to chew on. But the spirits of just men made perfect. Remember, I, I, I don't know if you heard me say I said Job was a prophet. You can't read that, you can only be taught that. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. Remember, I said there's different meanings inside of that, but they all build on each other. But the greatest layer is that it's the duty of past prophets to minister to current prophets. Mm -hmm. But if you think Elijah's dead, you'll never know what Elijah knows. Mm -hmm. Remember, I told you, I said, hey, Elijah came back on the earth while Elisha was on the earth. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Sean said, uh, Papa, can you tell us about John? John's very much the same way. John, when you talk about death before time, John died earlier than what he should have, but it was permissible because John had completed what he was supposed to complete. So God didn't have a problem letting Herod cut his head off. God had no problem with it. The reason he had no problem with it is because he had accomplished what he was supposed to accomplish which was to be what? The forerunner. Now that Jesus is here, there's nothing left for him to do. So because he has successfully completed his assignment, he could have went off and spent his days in peace, but instead, he chose to mess with Herod. Well, Friday, what you doing to mess with these nice folks? <laughs> he chose to get into political ministry and he should have stayed into the field ministry. You see that? He had no business telling Herod what to do with his spouse. But since you asked me, I'm telling, but I'm, I'm like, I'm going to answer your question with a question. What you think? You know, people get, hey, is Jesus God? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus is God. But I'm like, who you say he is? But the reason that happened is because the spirit of Elijah was working in him. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of Elijah failed against Jezebel. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of Elijah failed against Herod's wife. The same spirit working in him is what got John killed. It was Elijah that died, not John. <laughs> he got us killed. <laughs> Remember, Elijah said, let it be done to me if I don't have your head by tomorrow. If I don't do to you. Right? Mm -hmm. Jezebel wasn't out here. Before Before the Elijah showed up, Jezebel was just out here teaching people how to be nasty, how to, how to be fornicators. And even in that, a lot of times people miss the language of what's being said. So we take Jezebel and we equate her down to fornication. The fornication wasn't just sexual fornication. The fornication was whoring against other gods, whoring with other gods. You see? So you make it about Jezebel. Like Jezebel's a hoe. Jezebel had one husband. <laughs> and she wasn't whoring on him. She had one spouse. But what she does was she was a priestess of Baal. And she perverted and led the other people astray from serving Jehovah God 
and to serving other gods, which God deems what? Fornication, because he's married to us. You see the language? Because he's married to us, and then when we step away from our husband, it's fornication. Jezebel, I will cast her into a sickbed for her teaching my people to fornicate. It wasn't that she just taught them, hey, go out here and just have, you know, go do things that are inappropriate. That's a part of it. But the nature of it is that she turned them from God to serving other gods. Does that make sense? That's what Jezebel's about, not about makeup. <laughs> oh, you a Jezebel. <laughs> you, Jeze you Jezebel spirit. Right? The spirit of Jezebel turns people away from God. That's what the spirit of Jezebel does. It turns people away from serving Jehovah God. I I'll show you. I'll show you. Hold on. I'm going to teach you what the spirit of Jezebel does. So when you, when you pray, you can you can rage war with wisdom. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. This is Revelation 2, never the 2 and 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great, into great tribulation, unless, excuse me, they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the mind and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Did you see that? Jezebel is going to be cast into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her. The adultery with her is that you also go after other gods. That's the adultery. Not that you're just not, sexual morality is a part of it. Remember I said there's layers inside of it. The adultery is that it ain't, it ain't enough for Jezebel to go around. Just, just think about it practically. There ain't enough of Jezebel to go around if everyone's doing it with her. <laughs> it's not enough of her to go around. And then it talks about her children, meaning what she produces. I will kill. That's what it's talking about. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know. And eat things sacrificed to idols. That's what Jezebel teaches. She teaches people how to eat food, sacrifice idols, not put on makeup. Mm -hmm. We make it about control. At no point in time was control mentioned once, was it? Yeah. Sexual immorality and fornication. Excuse me, sexual immorality, food, sacrifice to idols. Mm -hmm. She was a seductress. Not seducing them just to the physical nature, but seducing them away from their God. God always likened that to fornication. That's why he says things like what? I'm married to the backslider. You see, it's a language. It's not just this and nothing else. So I'm not against um, praying a certain way or, or, or certain things. That's good, too. But I'm just coming to add, add to. Amen. <laughs> What does it mean when they say eat things sacrificed to idols? Like, what were they eating and what idols? It means exactly that. When it says that it was talking about food sacrificed to idols, it was exactly that food that was sacrificed to the gods that they served. Very much like when Daniel, when Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, that's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I try to give them a little bit of honor and get their real names in there every once in a while. I'm, not, I'm sorry they did y'all like that, man. Love you. All right. But with those three young boys, and in addition to Daniel, 
it talked about how they didn't want to partake in the food that the king prepared for them because it would defile them. They knew that the king was taking all of that food and presenting it to their false god first before they served it. And if the food is presented to the false god and you partake of it, you partake in that god also. Daniel understood that it would weaken his spirit if he did that. But then Paul, on the other hand, said, I can walk into a temple and eat that which is sacrificed to idol and it has no effect on me. Why? His spirit was at a different capacity. His spirit was built up into a different place. So I'm not suggesting you just walk up into, you know what I mean? Lead, lead the big stuff for, for big boys, right? Don't just go, yeah, I got this. <laughs> yeah, don't, um, don't trip yourself up. But that's what that was about in, in light of sac- eating food that sacrificed idol. The food was set before their gods, and then it was set before the people. And if it's set before their God, it's the same as worshiping that God. That's why we give thanks unto God when we have what we receive. Father, we thank you for this, which you've given us. Why? It's sacrificed by our God to us. Jesus took it, broke it, and gave thanks. All of them partook in his God when he did that. It's just the flip side. They break it and give thanks unto those idols, and then they serve you with it, and you partake in their God. Which makes sense? Yeah, so not I wasn't trying to get on a rant about Jezebel, but that that's Jezebel. Jezebel's not about that's the old old school church. You know, you got some makeup on, they got a cover. I mean, let me talk to your daughter. That's not that's not Jezebel. Jezebel teaches you to commit idolatry against God. Jezebel teaches you to fornicate with other lovers besides Jehovah God. You gotta realize what the prophets of Baal were prophets at one point. These weren't, these weren't just idolaters. No, they were prophets first. Then they became prophets of Baal. How did they become prophets of Baal? They were seduced. They were seduced. That's why Elijah was like, hey, I got something for you. Prophets been drawn to divine lines for a long time. Moses said, hey, if you would, if you would me, come on this side. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, just uh, there's more than what meets the eye. Jezebel is more so about Baal than it is Jezebel, because that's who she serves. It's the altar which she ministered to, Baal. Baal was also higher ranking than Satan. Most people, most people don't know that Baal Baal was higher ranked than Satan. Baal Baal is something else. Baal, is, that's why I said. Don't go pick and fight you're not ready for. You, you've heard me say when I talk about Jezebel, right? Like, hey, if you can't minister like Elijah, don't go pick fights that Elijah had to fail. Elijah failed. Elijah failed. And the same test that he failed, John the Baptist failed also. Because the spirit of Jezebel never died. Now, I'm going to put this all together for you. John is on the Isle of Patmos and... The angel of the Lord calls him up, right down the words of this prophecy. He's taking it all down, bop, 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 taking it all down. But between John and Jezebel, is a whole lot of years. Jezebel wasn't living when John was writing Revelation. But he's talking about Jezebel saying, I'm going to kill her children. It's the spirit and what it produces. You understand? So there is such thing as the spirit of Jezebel just as much as the spirit of Baal because spirits exist in the earth until assignments are fulfilled and completed. So Elijah's spirit went on to be with John the Baptist. Now, what you have to realize is that we've come to Mount Zion, the city of Renewal Angels, the city of Living God, all of that stuff, the spirits of just men made perfect. There are spirits that work with these men that are willing to work with you if you act and carry yourself like the way those men did. There are spirits in the earth that are willing to join themselves to you if you're willing to carry yourself the way those men did. The spirits of just men made perfect. When John falls, it's because Elijah is still working through him. And the spirit of Jezebel is still in the earth saying, I have to kill Elijah. 
So the moment Elijah pops his head on the scene inside of John, that spirit recognizes, says, okay, got him. And entices John into things that he shouldn't even be involved in. Like giving Herod marriage advice. You're not doing marriage ministry. Your job is to be the forerunner. Your job is to preach the coming of the Lord, nothing else. The moment he started dabbling in other stuff, look what he got him. So you'll hear me say a lot of times when people try to offer, hey, man, we should do, we should do this. It sounds good, man, but let me see, because that's not on, that's not on the checklist for this year. Why? I understand the moment I step outside of assignment, I run the risk of being injured greatly. And I have to consider all the people connected. You see what I'm saying? The moment I step outside of assignment without a go-ahead is a big risk. Now, in light of that, assignment is the thing that will keep you. Because if a man hasn't fulfilled his assignment, there are spirits that are willing to work with you to keep you alive until you have fulfilled it. Like Peter. He told Peter, Peter, the same way you walk about as you please now, when you're older, men are going to carry you about in ways that you don't want to go. He was telling him in which way he would die. Signifying a wood death, he would die is what it says. But when Peter's imprisoned, the angel comes and breaks him out. You see that? The angel breaks him out when he's about to die. Why? Because he was about to die before his time. So that spirit is committed to helping him fulfill his assignment. Remember I taught you that spirits will work with you to help you fulfill your assignment if you know what you're supposed to do. Peter's in prison. The spirit comes, breaks him out. He thinks he's in a vision. He doesn't even know it yet. And then he wakes up. Oh, wait a minute. He comes to himself and realizes that, okay, this wasn't a dream. This wasn't a vision. But then he still died in his later years. But the distance between him being locked up in prison and his later years was that he hadn't finished his assignment. That's the difference between that. He hadn't finished his assignment. So because he hadn't finished his assignment, God was willing to invest great aid to see to that he fulfill it. That was Paul. You know how many times they tried to kill Paul? They would stone him. They would catch him. They had to lower him out the window. All of these things they had to do. Obviously, he had to cooperate in running. So I'm not saying stand there and get killed. You're going to have to catch me first. <laughs> and you sure, as, you sure as hell going to have to put up a fight. <laughs> right? And you know we got that. Hey, I only carry the small ones to get to the big ones. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you got them choppers. <laughs> <Ra -ta 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 -ta. laughs> we got them things let loose. You say, God. <laughs> but even in that, man has an assignment to do, just like Peter. That's why Jesus will put Malchus's ear back on, because if he doesn't put Malchus's ear back on when Peter cuts it, Peter don't fulfill no assignment. Peter going to die next to Jesus. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Peter going to die right next to his Lord if he doesn't put his ear back on. When he puts the ear back on, all is forgiven. Now, I took mute my microphone. He said, say hello to my little friend. I got some I got some of that ministry in me. You think I you think I'll be praying in tongues? I'll show you some. <laughs> I'll show you some. What were we saying before we muted? Peter. Peter had to fulfill his assignment. And so because of it, 
a lot of men were kept through a lot of things so they could fulfill what God called them to fulfill. So when you talk about dying death before time, a lot of it has to do with what has God called you to do and are you committed to it? Because if you are, God will keep you. God will keep you. That's like Prophet Hagen. Prophet Hagen never experienced a sickness in his body. Even Smith Wigglesworth, you know, that's one of my personal favorites because he made it through most of his life without scandal or all his life really without scandal and most of the men of God they always end up getting slimed even if it's not true meaning but he made it with no scandal but when Smith Wigglesworth died he died at his friend's funeral and when he died he was walking up to the podium to mount to give some words and remarks and he fell and then when he fell they knew he was dead however what they didn't know was that 15 years prior the Lord came and says, it's time for me to bring you home. And he asked God for 50 more years to the date to keep working for him. Because more souls needed to be one. And more souls needed to be saved. And he asked God for 15 years to the date. And to the date was at that moment at the funeral. He walked up those steps and at the exact moment, our time, boom. He transitioned from one state of existence to the next. But if you were unaware, you would think, without the information, you would think the enemy attacked him because he was perfectly healthy. When they did his autopsy, they said not one, the, per the most perfect teeth you would ever see. Smith Wigglesworth never had surgery. He would say, no knife shall ever touch this body of mine. That was his testimony. No knife shall ever touch this body that God has given me. Now, he had to fight for that because the enemy came against him. But he overcame every time no knife ever touched him. But so when you talk about death before time, he had an assignment. When his assignment was done, it was time for him to go home. And men, that's, that's the way God works a lot of times. When God gives a man something to do, he will keep him so long as that he's working in his assignment. Now you get off track, <laughs> might be another story. But even in that, a lot of times there are things that if you don't have the full picture, you don't understand what God is doing. Because like Elisha, he was just simply transitioning from one state of existence to the next. It wasn't that the enemy was coming against him with sickness, although sickness was the form that God used. Like Enoch, God took him, transitioning from one state. Or you have the Adams. The Adam, the day you eat of this tree, surely you shall die. He transitioned from a state of existence also to being cut off from God. That changed the course. You see what I'm saying? All of that, all of that matters. When you look at God giving the power to raise the dead, that's to help men not die before their time. You see that? Ra the power to raise the dead isn't about just keeping people alive. Because the word of God says that there's witches or there are hunters of souls that keep people alive that should be dead. And there are people that de are dead that should be alive. That's what he would say. There are people that should be dead that are kept alive, and there are people that are alive that should be dead. Now, when we get to November and we do Glory and Power again, that's where I'll teach about some of the, the dark arts versus light arts. And I'll teach you about how, how certain things happen. I kind of drop some hints at when I say, hey, man, you could take a book and drop it. You know what I mean? We'll talk about that kind of stuff in November, like the ministry, like how, how certain things how certain things come to be. You have souls that are trapped deep in the waters. Witches can go to the edge of the banks of the waters, do a little stuff, boom, 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 boom. I'm saying boom, 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 because I won't say specifically. Do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, boom. A piece, you stuck in the water, don't know why. Literally. People dying that should be alive because they took the strength of that spirit and put it somewhere else. There's all kind of stuff, man. But if a man has an assignment, God will invest great measures to keep him as long as he's willing to work in that harvest field. You understand what I'm saying? So you got Revelation 2 still? I'm looking for where he talks about they should not taste of the second death.
It had all kind of stuff wrong, right? It said, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. No. It says, we have come to Zion. You see the difference in that, that proclamation? Marching means we have not arrived. We have come. We're going to need a little remix on that song. <laughs> That's why I like that song. You got it? Read it for me. Now, Jesus said this before he reads the scripture. Jesus says, he who keeps my words shall never taste of death. He who keeps my words shall never taste of death. Kind of like Enoch, he says that Enoch walked with God and he took Enoch so that Enoch did not see death. Remember I told you when you translate from translate from states of existence, boom, there's a certain gap inside of it that you don't taste it. You look over and you're on the other side. Jesus said that he who keeps my word shall never taste of death. That death that he's talking about is not being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what Jesus was talking about, not a physical death. He's talking about a death that comes when a man is eternally separated from God. A death like what Adam experienced. That's death before time. Because man was always created to be with God eternally. You came from God. Why would you not be with God? You see what I'm saying? You came from God. You are with God. Why would you not be with him forever? Like Paul said, whether I am asleep or awake, I am with Christ. Go ahead and read it for me, John. So he that have an ear, let him hear. So this means everybody does not have an ear to hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. If everyone had ears, he would have said, everyone give ear to hear. No. He that hath an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit is saying to the church. That ear is not an ear that's attached to your head. That ear is an ear of the spirit. And I'll tell you that you don't even hear with your ears spiritually. You hear with your eyes and you see with your ears. That's the way spiritual sight works and spiritual hearing works. You hear with your eyes and you see with your ears. Now go ahead. Yes. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He who overcomes shall not taste of what? The second death. The second death is when man is separated from God. Jesus said that he who keeps my words shall never taste of death, shall never taste his death. That's what happened to Enoch. He did not see death because God drew him to himself. So when you talk about death before time, we have to keep his words. We have to overcome that we can hear God. That God would put his spirit in us, not to separate us from him, to keep us to him. Do you think that God would bring you from himself to have you separated from him? His desire is towards us. It's the only reason he would devise a way and a means and a scheme to draw us back to himself through his son, Christ Jesus. You understand? So there's a lot of things inside of that, like I said. But death is the transition from one state of existence to the next. But whether we're in life or in life to come, whether we're asleep or awake, we shall be in Christ if we remain. Amen? Amen. All right, so I love you deeply. Um, We'll be back next week. Let's get this ball rolling. I look forward to fasting and praying with you guys next week. God bless you. Jalen, wake him up for me. All right, YouTube, I love you. God bless you. Oh God.
off the mountain till I get my blessing And I don't know where it is, so I watch where I'm stepping And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression Cause once upon a time, had to learn a little lesson Read it, in the holy book, I know the reverend said it You're misunderstood, but if you read it and let it Open up the truth, you would find that it would open up everything inside of you But everybody wants to be put on How you even making all these songs? Like how you get the money, how you get the fame? But why don't you ask what's the catch behind the diamond rings though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego. He see everything. I promise you won't get away with my anything, girl. Yeah. That's a cold hard truth I'm being honest Don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my steps So I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true You can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey They would love me But what does it matter If he ain't rooting for me God help me What the yeah, I can't do this alone God Never aggression. Cause once upon a time, had to learn a little lesson. Read it 